Good afternoon. I'm Craig here, director of the campus-wide initiative, Arts for All. And it's an honor to welcome each of you to this afternoon's program, The Power of Music, a Community Conversation. Arts for All, the College of Arts and Humanities, and the School of Public Policy have collaborated to bring the University of Maryland community and the Jerusalem Youth Chorus together through music and poetry, revealing our common ground. Today, we'll begin with a poem written by a University of Maryland student, R.C., a senior undergraduate English major and winner of this year's inaugural Sadat Poetry and Music for Justice and Peace competition. Students were asked to create a poem centered on this quote by Frederick Douglass. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. Here is R.C.'s poem titled Rose in the Shredder, created in response to Frederick Douglass's quote. Hello, this is Rose in the Shredder. I am reaching over time and space and miles of ocean to touch the hand of Sappho. I am writing to a time that does not want my words. What can a flag or a protest shield when our leaders speak of drowning us? We don't want that perversion in our state, on our television, in our stories, at our workplace, in our child who is no longer our child. Mom, would you kick me out if I was gay? Well, we would give you a chance to change back into something we can love again. I am made of censorship of ripped paper and penciled in scrawls at the corners of the poems I wrote, the one I loved, tossed in the trash in pieces, but I still breathe the ink. Although I forgot the words, they are still mine. They live under my nails in the calluses of my heels, worn around my wrists, tucked between my metacarpals as condemnation and protection. Every breath with which I whispered my love's name to hide us from the world remains in my lungs. Lord, her lips were rose petals in full bloom. Mom, the poems do not mean anything. I was confused. I only wanted to be her friend. I took the poems I wrote and made them nothing, which is to say I destroyed them with my clumsy, trembling hands, which is to say I am culpable, I am complicit, I am a liar, I am the censor, the black stamped lines and the shredder blocking away the words no one really wants you to read. I took the poems I wrote and made them nothing, which is to say I appeased those who made me afraid, which is to say I took blades and put them through my own own hands rather than lash out and let someone else bleed by the love I have and cannot rid myself of, which is to say I am weak, I am afraid, I am considering that which should not be considered, and I let my words be wrapped in a black garbage bag and thrown away rather than speak them, which is to say I am not afraid of speaking anymore. This powerful poem and our student's voice is just one of the countless perspectives we know are crucial to bring together to reveal how different cultures and identities approach difficult moments and topics through music and poetry. Throughout history and all the complications that have accompanied it, the arts have long served as a point of connection and a constant reminder of the importance of community. Last November, we welcomed the Jerusalem Youth Chorus to perform here virtually. And now we are honored to welcome several members of the chorus here today to our campus in person as we share the space together, seeking to open our ears to consider the varied perspectives offered now. College of Arts and Humanities Dean Stephanie Shanakan and I could think of no better partner for this conversation than Robert Orr, Dean of the School of Public Policy. Please welcome Dean Orr. Thank you very much, Craig. A year ago, the School of Public Policy began conversations with Arts for All and the College of Arts and Humanities about hosting the Jerusalem Youth Chorus as a part of their planned U.S. tour. After the shocking events of October 7th, we still hoped that at some point in time a concert could happen. And we felt that the opportunity to showcase a group of young people that included Palestinians and Israelis creating together and encouraging dialogue was more important than ever. 
Unfortunately, their tour was not possible. We are so grateful to the Jerusalem Youth Chorus and the representatives here today for being able uh, to make it here to the University of Maryland and to join us for this uh, belated, delayed celebration of the power of music and dialogue. The Jerusalem Youth Chorus, which has been providing a space for young people from East and West Jerusalem to grow together in song and in dialogue since 2012, still gives us hope, and most certainly still gives me hope, that the future, even when the ongoing pain makes the future feel more distant than ever, is still possible. The Jerusalem Youth Chorus is a dynamic reminder of the importance of varied and nuanced reality of the human experience and that policy decisions should be reflective of those lived experiences. After all, public policy is how we, citizens, communities, organizations, and governments come together to create positive change for the public good and for the good of all. It's that coming together to create change that makes me honored to be here this evening to represent the School of Public Policy and to partner with the College of Arts and Humanities and Arts for All. As I think we'll all experience this evening, the arts, particularly music, creates the opportunity to bring people together in a shared purpose and leverage that shared purpose as a starting point for discussions focused on collaborative solutions. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, this evening. I would now like to welcome my dear colleague and treasured collaborator, Dean Stephanie Shonekin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We've been looking forward to this gathering, um, and we are, I am, as an ethnomusicologist, this is what I'm here for, is conversations about music, the importance of music and culture and history. Um, so I look forward to that conversation. Throughout the fall semester, um, we, as a college, really grappled with how to deal with what was happening in our world. And this was, these were questions that were being asked in the classroom, our faculty were dealing with it, not just in arts and humanities, but across our, our campus. I want to acknowledge my other dean colleague, uh, Susan Rivera, who is dean of, of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, as well as so many colleagues here that are um, in different parts of the campus. We all, I think, can understand how difficult it was last, last semester. Um, so we, we, I was in the classroom last semester, and we had some really difficult conversations as a faculty member, we're deans, but we're, always, we're also sometimes back in the classroom, and I was last semester, and we had some difficult dialogue around what was happening. I was talking in that class, our topic was race and the American story. Um, and so right at the point, right after, um, around the second week of October, um, we were still thinking about what had happened earlier that month. And luckily for me, on the, on the syllabus, we were going to talk about a song called Strange Fruit. Strange Fruit was an excellent way of bringing us back together, um, helping us think about the power of music to really um, tell a, a story about what is happening with our, with our human dignity, with our humanity. And so um, I, we could think of no other song to really um, kick us off this, this evening um, than the song Strange Fruit. Strange Fruit is a song that was written in 1937 by Abel Merpol, a Jewish teacher who wanted to write about what was happening in the South with the lynchings of black people. And so he wrote, he wrote the poem, set it to music himself, and then in 1939, none other than Billie Holiday picked it up, and that became um, a signature piece for her. Every time she sang it, people were moved, because not only do the words tell a story of what humans do to humans, but it also tells a story of, of 
solidarity between a young Jewish uh, teacher and uh, the, what he saw as, as something that was happening in the black community. So um, it, it served me well in, in the classroom. And so I asked um, my good friend Tim Powell, um, our, our professor of saxophone, to um, bring, bring along his, his wonderful um, uh, collaborators, Lenique and Min, um, to help us think about music and history and, um, and shared common ground. Um, so they will help us to think about this through Strange Fruit. our mezzo soprano and Min Vo on piano. Thank you.
-hmm. So you can see here that music can be somber. It's also very beautiful. Um, but it is also really um, important to think about what these songs say, what they do, and how they frame the world and the, and, and, and the stories that we experience. Um, before we get into our conversation, um, Micah was, was lovely enough to, to share with us a soundscape. So the Jerusalem soundscape, we'll, because we want to place ourselves um, there. And so this is, Micah, do you want to, to, to say a minute, a word about this? Sure. Yeah. And, and first of all, thank you all so much for having us um, and for all the care that you have taken to really frame all the conversations I think that we've had mm -hmm. in such thoughtfulness and in such um, humanity mm -hmm. that like we're really trying to center that um, in everything that we do and we felt really, really deep resonance um, in all of the conversations that we had. So thank you for helping us to feel uh, safe um, and responsible sort of coming here, mm -hmm. even in a time when most colleges are being ripped apart by exactly what we're about to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, what we're about to hear is a, a soundscape of some of the ways in which sound claims space in Jerusalem and defines who space is for and who it is not for. Um, and so as we, as we listen to it, I'll sort of narrate through a bit like what we're also hearing. Great. Kudos to our team over there, <laughs> our, sure. our technology team, big ups, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we definitely weren't doing a live stream uh, two hours ago <laughs> when my computer died. Okay. So, so this is all the different calls to prayer from the different mosques happening and the church bells of many different denominations as well that often compete for space in the same literal buildings. You have the prayers of worshipers at the Western Wall, but of course the men who are allowed to pray out loud and the women who are not supposed to pray out loud but are doing it anyway, depending on who you ask. You have the protesters who are protesting the women who are praying out loud in the Western Wall. These are all Jews, protesting Jews, by the way, in this context. Um, and then you have the National Day sirens um, that mark who we memorialize and who we don't and who everyone needs to stop for. And of course, the ambulances and police sirens that are all too frequent in this kind of a space, in this kind of a wash where everyone is trying to use sound to say that this space is for me and not for you. Mm. Mm. And that's the context in which we work. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's in many ways, like Jerusalem sounds beautiful. Jerusalem is an extraordinary place and it also sounds like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's important, I think, to recognize that because it's so easy to try to maybe reduce what we're doing mm -hmm. into some sort of like butterflies and rainbows, mm -hmm. like let's all just use music and get along mm -hmm. kind of scenario. And that's really a vast oversimplification um, of both where we are working and what we're trying to Absolutely. do to, to use sound and music specifically mm -hmm. to transform some of the ways that people relate to space and each other. Mm -hmm. And as an ethnomusicologist, I also think, you know, what is music anyway? It's all of those sounds, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I do want to, uh, be, before I introduce our our panel here, I want to um, acknowledge that today is Edel Fitri, so we would yep. be hearing those those calls for, for, for mm -hmm. prayer as well, um, and that is something that um, I wanted to, uh, to acknowledge up front. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Mm -hmm. um, 
So here we, so you've just heard from Micah Handler, which was also interesting that you were speaking, I could hear you, but not everybody could hear you. And that is, that is so much of what we go through on these campuses. There's so mm. much noise that and people are speaking, but nobody's listening because mm. there's so much noise. So symbolically also, I think that was powerful. Um, so Micah is the director of the Jerusalem Youth Chorus. Very, very, very happy to have him back on, on campus. With Micah, we've got Amir um, over there. Amir, welcome, and I'll, I'll have you speak a, a, a little bit. We also have Dana, Dana, right. Dana, good, thank you, and, and Yara, right? Um, so let's just start with a, a, a question um, that situates you in, in that space. Um, if you could start with um, telling us about where you grew up and how you relate to that area. You want to start, uh, Amir? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having us uh, again. Yeah. And my name is Amir, and I'm a I'm Palestinian from uh, Jerusalem. But I, un until fifth grade, I actually didn't grow up in Jerusalem. I grew up in a small village next to Jerusalem, uh, next to Beit Hanina, where I live today, in inside Jerusalem. And I remember growing up there, playing uh, uh, football with my cousins in the family compound that we had where we all lived at the same uh, village until and basically every day me and my cousins would walk from the village that we lived in to Bet Hanina where I live today 10 minute walk to go to our school and then uh, until one day I'm going back uh, me and my cousin go going back from the school and seeing this big wall is being built around our village mm. And that 10 minute walk turned into a whole one hour car drive from my village through a couple of villages to a checkpoint to get into Jerusalem and to get to uh, our school. And I remember how long and how boring that <coughs> drive was. So me and my cousins do this meeting and we decide that we're not gonna do the drive and we're gonna walk again. <laughs> Since the wall was still being built, we found this place where we scooch from and my cousin put me, his hand <laughs> for me and I climb and we scooch basically uh, to school. And I remember how much unsafe I felt doing that, mm -hmm. right? I even remember one day we were coming back and we wanted to scooch from uh, the wall to go back to our village and the big uh, Israeli jeep army passing through and me and my cousins had to run and hide. Mm. And I remember how unsafe mm. I uh, felt growing up. And um, even though we had the blue ID, like I'm, I'm a resident of the uh, Israeli state. I, I, I live in Jerusalem today mm -hmm. because many Palestinians have the green ID who doesn't give them the right to live in Israel. They live in the West Bank and in Gaza. And for me, I still had the ID, but I still felt scared. Mm -hmm until a police uh, officer stopped my dad in the mosque in our village and told him, you either leave or uh, you're gonna lose your residency and freedom of transportation. And we had to leave and all the family will spread around. Mm. And then this young Palestinian me who uh, grew up in this village with my cousins moved to Jerusalem and continued to feel unseen and continued to feel that I had to hide who mm -hmm. I am to, in order for me to exist and be uh, in Jerusalem. I mean, I think that's a story that resonates with, with many p people around the world. You know, a black woman in the United States, also as an immigrant, but also those, I you know we, we have some African Americans in the room who um, were, have generations here. Um, that's something that they can resonate with. Thanks, Amir. Dana. Dana. Mm -hmm. um, I also grew up in East Jerusalem, uh, but my mom's side of the family is from the West Bank. And referring back to the soundscape, I think the mosque sounds, uh, the call for prayer is something that I heard all around me in Jerusalem. And I went to a Catholic church where I also got to hear the bells, mm -hmm. but never did I ever hear the calls for prayer in the Western Wall. Um, as a Palestinian, I grew up quite separate until I joined the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, which was um, something out of the ordinary, and it still is to this day. It's something that's going actively against a system 
that's designed to keep people mm-hmm. separate. Um, so I've never heard the call of prayer or the prayers um, from the Jewish side, although the mosque, al Aqsa, is less than a kilometer away. Mm-hmm. It's just the wall separating. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember having to visit my grandma in the West Bank and having to cross checkpoints very regularly. But I never quite understood that this was something unnatural. I never reached that conclusion of not every person goes through this. Mm. Um, And I remember very vividly one time I was talking to someone in the choir and they told me that they live five kilometers away from where my grandma lives in the West Bank, um, except they're Israeli. And they had a completely different experience of the checkpoints, of getting to the choir, leaving the choir. Um, And I understood that the system that's designed to keep us apart, it's the reason why all of this happens, and it's the reason why everything is possible. When you keep people separate and they're not interacting, and for example, an Israeli living in the West Bank in a settlement has no clue that I spend two more hours on the road than her to get to the same place from the same distance. That's what allows for all of this to happen. And so JYC gave me and many others the platform to explore all these different layers of the conflict that normally would just be normal things to all of us. Um, And so I'm grateful to have the space to represent and also to learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yara? Um... So I've lived very different lives than Amaya and Dana. Um, I actually grew up in the south, near the Gaza envelope. And the soundtrack of my childhood was very much war and missiles Mm -hmm. and escaping kind of the south to move to a safer place. Um, And for me, Jerusalem was a very safe place. It's a place where I felt I can walk alone in the street in my neighborhood. I felt like I can go to school very easily, very fast, where as a seven-year-old my mom could send me alone. And I think when I joined, when I joined the choir was the first time I saw more than the beautiful elements of Jerusalem and more than the diverseness of Jerusalem, but I saw the complexity and I saw the different realities. And I realized that as easy as it is for me, as is it's hard for other people. Mm-hmm. And I think to realize that your privilege is because also someone else is having, mm-hmm. is not having that privilege. Mm-hmm is a moment of realization that you didn't earn anything, Mm. but you were given something. Mm. And I didn't earn being safe and walking, and I didn't earn going to school not fearing, and I didn't earn walking 10 minutes, but it was given to me. Mm -hmm. And no one should earn those things. Mm. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, so all of all three of you have talked about um, the system, right? The, the system that has created these divisions and this this structure, um, and you've all also talked about how the Jerusalem Youth Chorus has been a place that has given you some some refuge in in a sense. So, Micah, I'd love to here ask you the same the the first question but also start moving towards how music then becomes part of your identity um and then we'll we'll talk i I would love to hear how music really features and functions for for the choir sure yeah thank you and i can say every time i get to speak with any of the three of you i always am learning and i'm always in awe of just like the people that you are and the ways in which you have grown in together in like all these ways it's just it's amazing so i wanted to acknowledge that um for me music 
has always been the way that I've connected to other people. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I've been singing since I was born, basically, and and certainly as a very young person, didn't know how to do much else. Like I was very awkward and socially maladjusted, <laughs> and like the only places really that I felt accepted were in groups of people who were singing. So needless to say, that was like a very important context for me. Mm -hmm. um, and as I grew up, I ultimately saw that if I started singing groups I actually could create new communities mm -hmm. I was like oh that's very interesting um, and that's sort of one thread of how the chorus came to be and how I would have thought that something like this could be helpful um, the other was my own experience uh, growing up uh, with a very sort of one-sided narrative around what's going on um, in Israel-Palestine and being taught all kinds of things that I only learned in direct sort of dialogue spaces with conversation with people who I had come to trust and build a relationship with mm -hmm. who then said, actually, all those things that you were taught about me were wrong. Mm -hmm. And because this is what I actually think and this is what my life is actually like. Um, and that was transformational for mm -hmm. me. And so I stayed involved in that kind of work as well, that sort of dialogue as a means of, of, of self-relational and sort of communal and societal transformation um, is the other thread. And so as I spent more time in those spaces, I saw that music and specifically singing in groups could play the same kind of community building role, even in a place where people are supposed to hate each other and have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. Um, and that music could be that glue, could be that sort of interstitial tissue um, to really build relationship and create containers where difficult conversations could happen mm -hmm. without them exploding, right? Mm -hmm. And so as I was sort of learning that, I was then exploring the intersection of those two threads like very 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 deeply mm -hmm. um, I studied Arabic I studied different Middle Eastern musical traditions I had studied Hebrew before and ultimately actually like wrote my senior thesis um, in college I was studying music and international studies and basically wrote my senior thesis on is it possible to do <coughs> long-term on the ground musical and dialogue-based Israeli-Palestinian youth programming. Mm. So, and ultimately, based on that work and sort of eight years of having really explored the intersection of these two things very deeply, then decided to go to Jerusalem and see if I could Make actually create something mm. that would be different mm -hmm. um, than the dominant reality, and that's how the chorus came to be. I mean, we need to let, let our students know that their thesis should be... Can be relevant. <laughs> I mean, you have, to, you have to be, like, singularly obsessed in, like, a really we are weird kind of way. Here at yeah. of but, um, but it is it is possible to do your thesis mm -hmm. if you really pick the right <laughs> That's incredible. Um, and, Micah, you grew up... Here in, here the, in the United yeah, States, and exactly. then you went back, yes. Um, so incredible. So... Uh, let me start the discussion on music in y'all's lives um, by posing a question that ethnomusicologists have an answer for. And the question is, is music a universal language? Mm -hmm. Ethnomusicologists say, no, it is not a universal language. So what's your take on this question? And what's your personal take, having spent time in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus? I mean, how, how, does, how does music function as a universal, as a binder? Yeah. Uh, who, who, who wants to start? Mm. Want to start yet? Sure. Um, I will Diana. debate ethno... Musicology? Uh, ethno -musicology. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> as a very qualified JYC <laughs> member. <laughs> I think the question itself is interesting because I do believe that music is a manifestation of identity mm -hmm. and the beauty of it is the diversity of it. And I think when you asked earlier, do you see music as a part of identity? The first thing I thought of is, yes, it's a manifestation of everything I want to say and all the political statements I want to make mm -hmm. very loudly right. by just being myself. And so, for example, for me, uh, when I go back to Jerusalem, my language that I grew up speaking and my mother tongue 
which is Arabic, isn't even an official language of the country, mm -hmm. despite having a very large population yeah. that speaks Arabic. Mm -hmm. And then I get to places like the choir, where I don't have to make a political statement saying, I need representation, I need you to consider my language an official language, but I have me, myself, as a Palestinian, and other Israelis singing in Arabic mm -hmm. um, with me, alongside all these traditional songs that if you sing to any Arab person, they'll go crazy, like, <laughs> ah, that song. Um, and in that sense, I guess you could call it a universal form of communication okay. with multiple <laughs> languages. <laughs> Point to Dana. <laughs> Very well done. Okay. Yeah, I believe okay. that it has helped me nurture mm -hmm. connections with many other people, mm -hmm. and it's helped me show a lot of myself without even needing to say a word. Powerful. Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think I have many different answers, <laughs> um, especially because I have been doing music since I was four years old. I also play the harp, and I'm currently doing my master's in contemporary music, wow. um, which kind of sounds maybe like the, the soundscape sounds like the the before yeah. in many ways. Um, I also, I would say... I do not think musical uh, music is a, is a universal language. You do not think? I do not think. High five, girl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Explain why. I will explain. Um, I think as someone who grew up studying classical music, it's, it's amazing and it's a, an art form that I love and respect and is part of my childhood and is part of my adulthood and will be continuing to be part of my life. But it is very exclusive. And mm -hmm. it excludes um, everyone who doesn't have access to it. Mm -hmm. And we try to make it something, I think people who really appreciate mm -hmm. the art try to make it something for everyone. Um, but in many ways, it kind of sets itself aside and pretends to be something more something better than other um, genres of music. Mm -hmm. And I think we had kind of a, an amazing conversation about that in a car, that <laughs> every type of music has its strengths, mm -hmm. and it has um, it had something that it's missing. And so I think that kind of perception is very harmful mm -hmm. to many incredible genres of music. And, and when I came into the choir, I came in with this kind of like, I've been studying music. Yes. I know. <laughs> I am a 14-year-old girl, and therefore, <laughs> I know everything. And I came with the perception that because I can read the sheet music and because I can read uh, notes, mm -hmm. that I have a better perception. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. I learned harmony, then I have a better perception. Mm -hmm. And getting into that space of someone singing Mawal to you, and mm -hmm. realizing, oh, I could absolutely never do that. Mm -hmm. And really realizing that is an art form of its own. Right. Mm -hmm. And realizing that there are so many different places for music to have its strength. Mm -hmm. And music is a way to build narratives. And it's a way to build strength. And it's a way to build community. Mm -hmm. And I think when you understand that it is not that. Mm -hmm. It is not something that is... Not everyone can be a part. Mm -hmm. But when you try to make it that, that is the, that is the beautiful part. And mm -hmm. so I think getting into a space where you can sing in multiple languages and multiple types and genres of music. Mm -hmm. And we have some classical pieces and we have pop and we have... Um, we sing in makams and we have like religious music, like um, Jewish... like prayers and we have this kind of variety where everybody can feel a part and everybody can feel like they're like trying to be a part of mm -hmm. another person's mm -hmm. um, community and, and their experiences and I think that is where we start to have that share, like sense of community yeah and and yeah. I think what what um, what Dana said about this this shared communication rather than a shared language. Because yes. when you got there, you had to learn. You, you couldn't just go there and just, um, and just expect that you would know what to do. 
um, with that particular piece. You all, you all also do hip hop, right? So True. I've, I've, I've heard that. I loved it. Um, <laughs> it's um, Amir's forte. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> so Amir, um, what about you? you yeah. Is music a universal language? So for me, as someone who uh, didn't grow up on in a musical family or on music, like at all, I just uh, it uh, it happens that I am in a room next to the room where the chorus rehearsed. <laughs> and I always saw the community that the chorus had. Mm. And I fall in love with the chorus because of the friendships mm -hmm. and the community that I saw mm -hmm. that uh, I lacked in my own uh, personal life. And I kind of did some beatbox when my friend <laughs> told me when I was doing... <laughs> right? But uh, I, I basically met Micah through that, mm. uh, of like, uh, I saw Micah and I was like, uh, who's this Micah who speaks uh, really good Arabic? <laughs> um, and I auditioned for the choir and I told Micah on the audition that I don't sing, but mm -hmm. I really into this. And if you give me a chance, I will make myself sing. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, for me, when I uh, uh, when I joined the choir, I couldn't believe that I'm in a kind of this program because, for me, growing up as a Palestinian in Jerusalem, I didn't until today. We don't have enough opportunities mm -hmm. for the people who live in Jerusalem, and I fall in love with the community that the chorus developed to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say, music is a community builder. Because still in the choir, we meet people needs musically, mm -hmm. so they can feel uh, uh, included Part in the music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not, we don't only sing uh, Western music, mm -hmm. right? We sing multiple uh, different uh, uh, styles and genres of music, mm -hmm. so everyone can feel uh, included. Mm -hmm. okay. So I would say music is a community builder. Nice, mm -hmm. very nice. Yeah. I just, I just, uh, I want to note that we have a distinguished professor of the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures here, Saul. Um, and we have lots of, of, fa of faculty, Eli, who also um, thinks about languages as well. So, um, so, so I, I, think that, I think that language, why we, we say it's not a universal language, is just that we, we spend time thinking about how to get into the group, you know? What do we have to learn to get into the group? What does the, what does the music mean? Right. Um, to an extent, what what Dana said about the, the communicative part of that shared experience is true. You can hear a sad song and you know it's sad. Right. Mm -hmm. You may not know what it means, but but you know it's sad or celebratory or or, or whatever. Um, so I want to now turn um, and I'm looking at at the time we could talk forever, but mm -hmm. I want I want to turn now to um, to talking about how the music, the meaning of the music has changed since October 7th. Mm. What, what, how does the music function um, in this, in this, this period? Now, there's, there's always been tension, right? And Micah, your thesis was all about how, how do you um, use music to mitigate what's, what's happening there? Um, has that changed for for you, Micah? And then I'd love to to, to 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 hear from all of you. And then we do have a treat for the audience. They will they will give us a per performance as well. So I wanted to save a little time for for that. But I'd love to really talk about what what's happening now. Yeah, it's a perfect question in sort of where we've arrived. Right. I think right now. Um, in some of in, in in some ways I think music is doing exactly what it does best for us right now. Mm. And the fact that we are a musical ensemble is why we are able to continue to meet. Like if we were just here to have political conversations, people probably would have decided it was like too hard and too painful and just to like leave. And similarly on the other side, if we were only doing music and not being real about what Which was going is, on mm -hmm. and had no space to like mm -hmm. have difficult conversations, people also would have left. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's the combination there that I think is really most important. And the fact that at the same time music has this ability not only to be for the members of the group, but also a platform for us collectively to 
try to actually change the realities that we're living in, mm. in the ways that we can. Um, and so in that sense, music has functioned exactly the way it was intended to um, in this time. Um, also, I can say that specifically Dan and Yara, like, were involved in a collaborative songwriting process mm. that we worked through in this time, mm. specifically reacting to this moment in history and in their lives, and wrote extraordinary verses um, that I think would definitely be worth, like, as direct answers mm -hmm. to your question. To yeah. um, and and Amer, I think it would be really interesting also to, if you want to share about the parents' meeting and like why people felt that this was like important yeah yeah okay um yeah so i basically growing up in the jerusalem of course i understood that this is the community that i want to stay in and in december 22 i had the chance to become the executive director of the jerusalem of course and help the new kids and the new uh, singers from East and West Jerusalem, Palestinian and Israelis, also experience the experience that I had mm. uh, through the program and also take this model into different places around Israel and Palestine and build the new leaders that we need. So basically we're preparing for the, new, uh, for the year to start. We have amazing opportunities. We just recruited amazing singers with the amazing new staff and did... Uh, uh, a uh, staff retreat and a, a, a retreat for the high schoolers mm -hmm. and then uh, 7th of October basically uh, happens mm -hmm. and I didn't know what should I do mm -hmm. uh, if we can meet or not mm -hmm. and especially for me as a Palestinian to be doing this work is very heavy right because you don't only work in this mm -hmm. you live it mm -hmm. right and you get pushed by your community mm -hmm. for doing what you do mm -hmm. since now especially now people are so polarized, either you're with us or against us, kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And then having my Israeli friends reach out to me and ask me what I think about 7th of October. Do you condemn or you don't condemn, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm your friend and you know who I am and we've been together for so many years. How come you'd ask me this question? Mm -hmm. You know me. And most of the answers were like, we don't know you. Mm -hmm. And I can understand the break that happened from the Israeli community to the Palestinian community who live uh, 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 who uh, who live uh, in the same area. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've been there always, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I stepped ten steps toward peace, and mm -hmm. I couldn't find any Israeli partner there because uh, the Israeli community was so shocked uh, of what happened seventh October and started attacking any Palestinian who's breathing, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't know what should I do, uh, especially with my work in the Jerusalem, of course. And I called for this family gathering where alumni, high schoolers, and their parents came uh, for two hours meeting on mm -hmm. Friday morning. And I was so honest with the parents and I told them that I don't know what should we do. Mm -hmm. We did have like two Zoom meetings, right, in the first two weeks, but we are acquired. We can't continue meeting on Zoom. Mm. And all in one voice, they told me, Amr, this is important to us and to our kids, mm -hmm. and we're going to mm -hmm. do whatever it needs mm. for them to continue to meet. Mm. And again, JYC lifted me up, mm. right? JYC was with me many years around my life that helped me lift up and stand up again. And especially in this moment, it lifted me up. Mm -hmm. And we continued to meet, the kids continued to come, mm -hmm. to sing and to have dialogue. Actually, before this uh, different song tour, we just had a retreat with the singers who were here and mm -hmm. with the alumni of the mm -hmm. of the tour, we spoke about 7th of October. Mm -hmm. And we, c we create spaces that are safe, mm -hmm. that our people could empathize with each mm -hmm. other and try to hold this multiple truths, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the choir, still many people don't agree with each other, mm -hmm. right? But still, they relate to this one place and call it right. home mm -hmm. uh, for the choir. And this is basically what we're trying to create in JYC. Mm -hmm. Not only show people, ho uh, not only show people that uh, an alternative is possible, right. 
and hope is possible, right? But we're trying to create the new leaders mm -hmm. who will lead mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. That must have been so hard. You know, as deans, <laughs> Susan and Bob, you know, we, 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 we are learning, we are learning, you know, this, yes, the idea of bringing the alumni back to, to, to help think through um, that, that difficult moment, so hum humble um, and generative, obviously, <coughs> while also recognizing that the, the disagreements are still there. Right, um, and I, I also want to acknowledge that we are in the Clarice Smith Center of, per of Performing Arts, where a lot of this this happens, where we, where our students and Lenique is uh, was our, our wonderful singer um, here. She looks different there, but <laughs> <laughs> but Lenique spent many an hour in this building with with other people who were singing and making music, you know, and and I think that's something that all musicians feel. Lenique, am I right? Yes, very right. Is that? <laughs> okay, um, I would love to, we, we all want to hear about the, the songwriting that, that you two c collaborated on um, after October 7th. Interestingly enough, we were supposed to go on tour October 18th, mm -hmm. and then the war happened October mm -hmm. 7th. Yeah. Um, so we continued meeting regularly as alumni and talking about the possibilities, so nothing was quite clear. Um, but going back to your question about whether or not the meaning of music had changed, I think the true meaning of music was more empathi emphasized, I think, at mm -hmm. least for me. Um, I see music as a revolutionary force. Mm -hmm. It gives voices to anyone who sings. And that's the way I see music, specifically in the chorus, where we get to write our own truths and create our own music. We're not just you know, doing covers of songs that mm -hmm. don't necessarily represent us. And even when we do covers, we add our own um, mm -hmm. sense of identity mm -hmm. because we're quite unique. We're doing something that actively goes against a status quo wanted by very powerful people mm -hmm. in very high positions of power. Um, and so to have that voice that actively goes against many mindsets is a privilege mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, and the song we got to work on uh, we wrote the Arabic and Hebrew verses, but it's also, um, it has like English for the choruses, so you all can listen to it, <laughs> you're invited to listen to it when it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and the Rot I verse uh, translates as follows, it says, The olive tree sheds tears of oil for everyone, it does not ostracize nor does it create herds, and the earth in summer and in winter carries me with my good deeds and my sins. Um, and this was a very difficult verse for me to share with the chorus um, in terms of this isn't only my personal verse, but rather something I'm singing in a binational space. Because first of all, um, when I talk about the earth carrying me with my good deeds and my sins, I'm mostly referring to my community where I felt like a lot of the times I was pushed to the extremes by my community and wanted because it's the easier way. I think seeing black or white is pretty easy, especially mm -hmm. in times of need for survival. Mm -hmm. um, so to actively go into the gray area mm -hmm. was quite right. difficult for me, especially with my community, because I do care about it. And I do want to be part. And I want to be part of something new in my community. Um, and secondly, it was difficult because the olive tree, specifically as a Palestinian who comes from um, a family of farmers, my grandma used to farm, and um, it's difficult to share a symbol of culture with a binational space when you grow up feeling like, if I am not protective over this symbol of my culture, I am going to lose it. Mm -hmm. And to get to a place where I'm able to share it and understand that I can share my olive tree and not have it come at my expense and not lose it um, was something I'm very grateful for mm -hmm. um, and I'm very grateful to have shared with the choir mm -hmm. as part of the song. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, um, I think music is a very powerful tool to create community and to create narratives and 
I think. Music has always been for me. Songs has always been for me, like a part of my a part of my childhood and a part of my adulthood and certain ceremonies at school and childhood songs that I used to sing for myself and things that I used to sing in memorial services. And I think growing up and understanding the meaning and the words and the intention behind things mm -hmm. is very powerful and very mm -hmm. eye-opening. And in relation to the uh, 7th of October, I think I heard a lot of empathetic songs and a lot of very violent songs. Mm -hmm. And they were all s familiar and they were all foreign to me. And it was very hard for me um, to hear them going around because I think they were everywhere. And especially with the social media being a very powerful tool in these kind of like times, hearing those kind of songs lead my, my everyday life was disheartening. And so when we were kind of talking about creating a song for the course that represents this time in our eyes and in what we're going through, that felt like I'd, I could breathe for a moment. And I think music is a very powerful tool and words are, very, uh, are a very powerful tool. And if you use them incorrectly, they can destroy everything. Mm. They can destroy everything that you build. And, and empathy is the other very powerful tool that we mm -hmm. have to use all the time, especially in these times. Mm -hmm. And so the verse that I wrote um, is an homage kind of to, mm -hmm. a, to a childhood song in Hebrew. Um, and it talks about the most beautiful girl in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And I see one of our people here recognizes it. And it talks about how she has the most beautiful eyes and the most beautiful mouth, and the most beautiful braid. Um, and it goes to say, I don't understand how you can be so sad when you're the most beautiful girl in kindergarten. Which for me as a kid, I was just, I sang that song because it was beautiful. And mm -hmm. I sang that song because the words are simple. And I sang that song because I could relate to it. And growing up, I realized the complexities of the song mm -hmm. and how I can have hope and I can have grace and I can smile and I can create safe spaces, but at the same time, I can have, I can have hurt and I can be sad mm -hmm. and I can have complexities. And it really resonated to me with the times that we're going through and my relationship to the choir. And the verse that I wrote says, Fabagan, the most beautiful girl in kindergarten, she has the saddest eyes in kindergarten. Mm. And she sits in the ruins of her kindergarten and she cries for those who are gone. Mm. And to lose the innocence mm. of, a, of a childhood song, it is heartbreaking. And to lose people that you love and family and friends and strangers that you love it's it's heartbreaking and we've all lost people and to remember that we are all hurting together but apart when we could all be hurting together huh. and lift each other up together it's so important yeah. Yeah. and so community is about coming together and sharing our stories and lifting each other up from the hardest moments Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So there's so much that you all have shared, and we're so grateful um, that you, and we didn't want to make this just about butterflies and flowers, daffodils. Um, we wanted to, to <coughs> help our community and those who are joining us on the live stream, help them understand that the work that you're doing is is work for us all, right? Um, I love what, what you said about we are all hurting, but separately. You know, we are all hurting, but separately. Um, and the music brings us t 
together. And Yara, the other thing that you said that was so profound is that music can be used in a different way. You know, it can be used to um, keep the violence going. You know, and um, and you all are being very careful about what you're what you're doing. Um, so, in that light, I would love to invite you all to please. Um, share with us um, a piece that we can get a sense of what the Jerusalem, a little small mm -hmm. flavor of what the Jerusalem Youth Chorus um, feels like. Thanks. So we'll be sharing, um, we'll be sharing a different song uh, than, the, than the one that Dana and Yara wrote. Um, we didn't know that that question was coming, but <laughs> I'm so glad that you shared those verses because mm -hmm. they're so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be sharing a song called In My Heart, which is in Hebrew and Arabic, and the words are mirror images of each other, and they are really about um, connection to place and like shared, uh, again, this sort of together apart, mm -hmm. right? That like everyone is sort of feeling these same things, but like in opposition to each other, but mm -hmm. like what if it wasn't? Mm -hmm. um, Cool. Should we go over there?
انتقيت طارت انتقورك حاولت كثير لكن تعبت الدعم عيونك في شي خلاني انحلم في خلاني دوم خلاني اعمل من حظ علينا هذا الله عليك دوم فين بلبس الدنيا الله عليك دوم شوف الدنيا في عينك من زمان صار عندي من خلط في دمي اسعد انساني بدي اشوف الله Thank you so much. I'm thanking everyone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Micah, Dana, Yara, and Amir. Okay, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was so beautiful, so gorgeous. Um, would love to, to know who wrote the song. Do you? Yeah, the song was written by uh, David Broza and Saeed Murad, um, who co wrote it in Israeli Palestinian. It's beautiful. Uh, musical collaborators mm -hmm. for many, many years, mm -hmm. both of whom are mentors of the chorus. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our technology team back there. Thank you. I want to thank Tim, Min, and Lenique for the beautiful rendition. Um, I want to thank my man back there. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And of course, my, my dear colleagues, thank you so much for being here. Those of you on, on the live stream, thank you for joining us. Um, and um, hopefully we'll see the whole group. It's, it's step by step. So yeah. last semester, it was just Micah. <laughs> Today, it's, it's, it's the four of you. Next fall, it might be something bigger. Um, Nick, also, thank you to Public Policy for, for um, co-sponsoring this. Thank you Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>